We're back on this Tuesday edition of your Coffee Break, and I welcome Josh Fisher. Josh hey, hosts CT Pulse with me Wednesdays at 1230. But he's joining me now because we have our special guest, State Senator Tony Wong, a return guest who we're happy to have back. Tony, thanks for joining us. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks yeah. for having me. Tony, interesting week last week. Uh, the regular session ended. No budget has been passed. You're going to be heading back there on Thursday? We are. We are. You know, what's remarkable is, you know, if you look at what we do as a General Assembly, the first and foremost priority is to develop a budget. The budget functions as a guideline for the three and a half million people that we represent in the state. But what's remarkable is, as we said over and over again, the governor, in fact, in February, when he made his State of the State speech, said, let's do our budget now. Let's make sure that we don't take the most important job that we have and push it and procrastinate till the last minute. And what do you have? <laughs> right. You have a budget that was put together and cobbled together um, that threw bipartisanship out the door because at the end of the discussion, Republicans were not included again. Um, and at the same time, there was really no transparency. When you think about it being the single most important document that we have, it was released six days ago when we talked about it, right? Mm. To this day, we don't know the details of it. Right. Is right. that not remarkable? Right. Is the fact yeah. that we have a document that guides what we do as a state, literally governing every dollar and cent that we do. It's critical. And that gets released and was practically going to be voted on six days ago. We waited till this Thursday. But would you believe, as of today, there is still no release. That means that the general public that would be impacted by this doesn't really know that the nonpartisan Office of Fiscal Analysis, mm -hmm. which would review and make sure the viability and, and the vetting of this budget, has not seen the document. Right. I, I know it shudders the idea that this is how we govern, and that's the frustration we have. We don't have a budget, and we don't understand it from a transparency standpoint. Right. Now, you, um, the Republican Party is in the minority, so they, they, you kind of, you guys don't have to be included in this, right? I mean, other than for this bipartisanship that was talked about back in February. So, what, <clears throat> what, one, when will you? Do you think you'll get to actually see the budget? Is it on Thursday? Um, but also, is it one of the things that um, was proposed was cutting the educational, uh, the ECS, sharing, right? uh, to mainly rather Republican towns, such as Fairfield that you represent? I, I, I will share this with you. Every town has a priority and focus on education. Right. The fact that, that we make these cuts based upon what you call the education cost sharing formula, it used to be a formula, but now it is actually an arbitrary application of funds, right. which is ironic, but then when you see literally 28 southwestern towns that are predominantly more perceived affluent mm -hmm. that were zeroed out. I mean, I've always taken the analysis that if you zero something out, that really even means more emphatically that you didn't even try. Right. You didn't even try to minimize and, and, and create the best scenario to minimize the impact on the communities. And the other part, to make it even worse, is the unpredictable nature of how we govern is we make these unilateral cuts on our municipalities when most of those towns have budgets already decided. Education, the mill rates have all been right. set, yeah. and now we throw and pull the rug from underneath them. So right. that's really the frustration that so many people feel. But I think the other part you talk about minority representation. The fact is, though, even though we're in the minority, we represent nearly 44% of the population. The idea that we have bipartisanship is not simply a, 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 a you know, kumbaya moment. It really brings different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have engaged debate, you make a better product. When you go into a room and you're in a silo, you create a build, you start reaffirming to yourself, yeah, this is a good idea, this works, but when you don't have critique, when you don't have transparency mm -hmm. and accountability, you create products. And we need to only remember that June 2015, when we passed this biannual budget that was done without any bipartisan input, it immediately cratered three months later right? because the transparency was not there. Well, the budget from two years before that kind of the same thing happened. But you need to understand, in addition to it cratering, in addition to how it impacts people's lives, and it does. You know, what we do in Hartford affects Main Street. But here's the problem. 
we need to also understand that those budgets were on the heel of two of the highest tax increases in the history of this great mm -hmm. state. When you think about that, we have high tax increases and we continue to run into shortfalls and deficits. Here's the problem. Something's not working. And let us all get to the table and make that arrangement. So minority party or not, have differing ideas to make things better is important. What my biggest critique on this budget is it made no long-term structural mm -hmm. changes mm -hmm. of how we operate as a state. But Hartford seems to be just like kind of how Washington is and how we've seen this presidential uh, you know, campaign all year where it's you're wrong, I'm right, and what's the point of actually getting together and agreeing on something? Because we've seen in Hartford ever since, particularly since Dan Malloy took office and there was the Democrats had complete control of, of Hartford that the Republicans' thoughts and opinions didn't necessarily matter when it came to the budget. Well, you know, look, uh, 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 you know, this is the week after Mother's Day. You know, yes. the reality in my household, one party rule doesn't <laughs> work, <laughs> right? And we laugh about it, but yeah. the fact is, the ability to have mutual respect, mutual input, makes a better product. And when you have the majority and, and you decide to kind of say, my rule goes, you know what? At the end, you have a flawed product. And, and so I think the frustration is, let's move away from, you know, partisanship. Let's mm -hmm. get together and say, Things need to change. You know, I, I really did like the phrase shared sacrifice. But if you really look and diagnose the, the, the breakdown, it's been the taxpayers that's been footing the bill. You know, I'm asking everybody to step up. You know, the Republicans did propose a budget, and mm -hmm. we made some structural changes. Was it pretty? No. Mm -hmm. But the reality is we looked at making legislators take pay cuts, increase contributions to our health and pension benefits, and really revisiting how we, as a legislative body, need to show the leadership in making the sacrifices. You know what? This budget doesn't do that. And more interestingly, I can't really attest to it because I don't yeah, know the details. Right. Isn't that not remarkable? It, it's a lack of transparency that, that is, is dumbfounded. Right. Now, Tony, it doesn't seem to just be the Republican minority that's upset. I mean, most of Connecticut media, there's been editorials. People seem very frustrated, again, with the budget process. Do you think that any of that pressure will help maybe move things along and help create some bipartisanship? We worked. I mean, the, 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 the incredible deficit numbers were shocking. So as a result, we did work together. We did go in the room and try to find some solutions. And, and the problem was, when it came down to making hard leadership decisions, the Democratic Party and the leadership, along with the governor, decided to go it alone. And, and, and you know what? I take no joy in, in, in an end product that, that will hurt people three months, six months, down, nine months down the road. And we need to understand, we need to make these structural changes now because literally, coming July 2017, we're going to have a new budget, a new biannual budget that is nearly $5 billion in deficit. We need to make these changes because what we're finding out is changes and deficit mitigation hurts the most vulnerable, hurts the people down on Main Street, hurts education. And, and I, I have to tell you, some of the things that I've found are, are, are really alarming. Case in point. We've advocated in the legislature and the governor's office to, to be a second chance society, to allow people that have suffered incarceration at, at the expense of, of mental health, substance abuse, domestic violence, and, and the cycle of poverty. Here's the problem. We have let people out, and I support that in the proper circumstances, mm -hmm. but now we just eliminated $10 million from the city of Bridgeport's reentry re program. We've gotten rid of the STRIVE program mm -hmm. to allow the formerly incarcerated, which is the new society's version of the Scarlet Letter, to say that we're going to educate, we're going to create a support network, we're going to give you pathways to gaining jobs, to reentry. We've eviscerated the program. How do you advocate on a philosophical standpoint and then sweep the rug from underneath those programs? How do you say that we have to be a social and just society to care for those most at risk and vulnerable and sweep the rug from underneath them by devastating their support programs? This is not how we govern. We need to address the concerns by being honest and prioritizing. Wow. So <clears throat> speaking of politics, now you guys had the Republican, the, the party conventions last night, the Democrats did too. Um, Democrats got to renominate 
everybody. You guys have a fresh slate. You you were uh, the vice chairman, right? Yes. Of it. yes. It was exciting. Yes. It's and so, uh, you know, John Shabin from the 4th District uh, down here in our corner of Connecticut, a uh, state rep from, uh, from Reading, uh, was nominated to run against Jim Himes. Um, and uh, Representative Bennett, right, from Bethel? No, I'm sorry. State Rep. Dan state Carter. Dan Carter. I don't yep. know why. Uh, Dan Carter. He won. Who I know I was, uh, saw John Kasich speak in Fairfield. You two uh, led John Kasich's uh, tr attempt uh, here, in, here in Connecticut. Um, what are the prospects for uh, your party coming into November? Well, it, it was an incredible experience working with Governor Kasich in Ohio, from Ohio on the presidential. Mm -hmm. What I saw in the presidential election was people got energized about the political process. They, they felt that they had some sense of ownership in this process. Uh, Donald Trump came into town, Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders. You know what? This is something that young people... And, 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 and more experienced and mature people can say, I was part of a presidential election process. Right. That can only bode well for activism. In, in the state convention, it's interesting. You know, I had a chance to read off all five of the congressional candidate people. And, and you know, before I started, I said, you know, first things first, we need to understand that anybody who runs for public office needs to be commended. Whether the Democrat, Republican, mm -hmm. Libertarian, the reality is, Politics has become so disengaged, and people have grown so disenchanted with it, they don't want to participate in it. It's gotten so mean. But for anybody who's willing to do that, they deserve our support and applause on that. But saying that, look, here's the reality. As I said to, to, to people, it is all in the candidates to be able to share a message, to right. define their own candidacy against a national platform, whether we agree or not. I, I said practically for us as candidates as republican candidates in connecticut to succeed we need to define fiscal responsibility and and social accountability those are connecticut republican mantras they're not the national republican party they're not the presidential candidate uh, mantra it is what we do in our communities and that's something that i reinforced over and over again as candidates running for state office and for your local offices mm -hmm. it's all about your community the party should be important, but at the end of the day, it should be about caring and respecting and representing your community. Quick, we got to go yeah. soon, but oh, sorry, go no, ahead. Go ahead. I We're just gonna... I want to quickly just know, kind of yes or no, will Trump help the Republican Party gain more seats as you guys have in the House and the Senate over the past few years, or hurt you? You know what? That that is one for the political scientists to <laughs> really keep their eyes on. <laughs> we'll leave it to them. You know, and I, I think yeah. it's fascinating because it at is. the end of the day, it it, it, it it shows a growing activism and engagement. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, we cannot we cannot forget what has created the 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 the, the, the enthusiasm and the activism for a Donald Trump and a Bernie Sanders on both parties is there is a tremendous disenchantment with business as usual. And I'm going to translate that to the state budget process we talked about earlier. It is business as usual. And unfortunately, it's hurting people. And as a result of that, there's fear, there's uncertainty, and people are taking back that they don't trust their government. Are you voting for Trump in November? <laughs> Why is that funny? It's He's a Republican nominee. He's not right. I am really focused on state politics and go. helping people that represent so no. the state. So you voted, you voted oh, for wait. Clinton? I do want to turn this back to the legislative session a bit. Tony, before we go, one or two things Kate that passed, bills everybody. that passed that you're really proud of or excited about in this Well, session. I think two bills that I, I think we do every day to, to make our community better. I think one bill I'm very proud of is the school safety threat. We have finally increased the penalties for those that make threats to our schools that aim to wreak havoc and create fear in our students, in our parents, in our educators. That has been raised to a level of a felony that reinforces again that you do not invoke these kind of fear in our communities. And we're going to catch you, we're going to punish you to the highest level under the law. I, I think the other issue is something that that we work very hard of and really by municipal leaders as well as firefighters is to create a bill that supports and, 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 and works toward the recovery of firefighters that, that catches cancer, that, that, that might be resulting on the, 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 the really 
hazardous job that they do going into fires with burning components that, that are so potentially toxic. Mm -hmm. We have understood that there is a social responsibility to, to provide safety and protection for those that protect us. And we did it because municipalities offered their input on fiscal costs. The firefighters came back with input and, 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 and flexibility and contributions. That's how we govern. Opposing ideas, sitting in a room, being adults in the sandbox, and, and just making a better product because at the end, that's our job. We are to represent the people that elected us. Well, Tony, I think that's a perfect way to end it. I think we need to wish you some luck going back this Thursday to Hartford. I wish more people had your attitude. I know. So. Well, it, 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 it's, it's, you know, going back as an immigrant and, and understanding that, that my parents escaped the communists and, and I grew up in a country that was supposedly democracy but was under martial law, that this kind of program and this kind of transparency does not exist and it's sanctioned by government is something that I'll never forget. And, and to be able to engage in the political process where I'm going to go back. The fact that we're going to vote on a budget that's presented six days ago and the general public that are going to be impacted by this does not know, that's, that's just unacceptable. Yeah.